Okay, let's today talk about a couple of common nutrition myths. There's a, there's a million myths out there all over the internet on various websites and in articles. Uh, a lot of these myths are, believed, are popularly believed by millions of people, but they're completely false. So I picked out a couple of the more common ones and the more outrageous ones. So I'm going to tell you the truth about them. The first myth is that you might, I don't know if you've heard this one, but uh, some sites talk say that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. So now, sci now, sugar is, excess sugar, without a doubt, is not good for you. So it's, uh, scientists have linked it with obesity, insulin resistance, increases in belly fat and liver fat and diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And sugar ha can be addictive. I, I've, I think I've, I don't know whether I did an, uh, I think I did a uh, article in my Applied Metabolics newsletter a while back about how sugar is addictive. I went into all the details. It's very extensive. I won't go into it here. But subscribers of Applied Metabolics could check out that article. It's, uh, it's uh, very interesting. It tells you what brain pathways are affected by sugar that causes people to become addicted to sugar. Uh, there's evidence to support the sugar addiction to both animals and humans. Uh, and it's addictive in the same areas of the brain as recreational drugs, including uh, cocaine. Uh, certain areas of the brain that produce uh, dopamine, a neurotransmitted dopamine. Sugar can uh, produce also, and some people can produce enough dopamine to make it kind of into, into an addicting substance. Uh, the notion that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine, it came from experiments with rats. And what they did is they gave these rats the option to either uh, drink uh, sw uh, water sweetened with sugar, or to uh, or to or to have intravenous cocaine. Uh, now you know rats respond to cocaine similarly to humans. They you know they get all hyped up and you know this and that. But it turns out that the rats preferred the unsweetened. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the sweetened sugar water to the intravenous cocaine. And because of the greater, much greater preference of sugar water over cocaine. This led to the idea that, <laughs> that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine, but it's never been shown to be true in humans. So now you know where that came from. Um, another one is uh, uh, another one is uh, that you should drink eight glasses of water a day. <clears throat> now, there is no actual scientific uh, verification of this. Somebody along the way just came out with a figure that you should drink eight glasses of water a day but there's no actual uh, nutritional requirement. You definitely have to drink water. It's very important. But the notion they have to drink eight glasses of water a day is strictly out of somebody's mind. It's, it's basically fiction. Uh, you know, the water intake varies. You, you shouldn't go by thirst. You should definitely drink water. It's very good for your kidneys. It's very good for, to keep your body hydrated. But to uh, you know, to force yourself to drink eight glasses of water because of some uh, because of some mythical nutritional requirement, forget it. Don't even think about it. Another one is calories don't count. This one you see a lot. A lot of people claim that calories are not important. Uh, well, they do count. If you consume fewer calories than you burn through activity, you'll lose body fat. It's that simple. There's no way to lose fat without a reduction in calories. No matter what you read, no matter what anyone says. Some some diets make it easier. Now this is true. Some diets make it easier to lower calories with, let's say, less effort than others. For example, I found that the lower carbohydrate diets make it easier for me personally to reduce my calories compared to, let's say, a low fat, uh, a low fat moderate protein diet where I was very hungry and it was very hard to reduce the calories. So in that sense, calories definitely do count. However, to say that all calories are the same isn't true. For example, while both amino acids of protein and carbohydrates invoke a release of insulin, only the carbohydrates, when consumed in excess, will promote fat gains. Contrary to what you see or read, no one, and I repeat, no one ever got fat from eating protein. It just doesn't happen. And I don't care what the, you know, they always say, well, protein has calories, so it can make you fat. It doesn't. Nobody ever got fat from eating protein. And I, and I challenge anyone to show me, anyone listening to this, who thinks that's crap, show me one person beyond and with definitive evidence that they got fat from eating only protein. Show me that person. It doesn't, that person does not exist. Uh, fat, now, now uh, another example is dietary fat. 
Fat contains the most dense source of calories at 9 per gram compared to 4, gram, 4 calories per gram found in protein and carbs. Some recent studies involving animals say that only fat can make you fat, not carbs or protein. In other words, you get fat only from eating dietary fat. It's the only nutrient that can actually produce or, or, uh, help, or, or uh, cause the body to synthesize body fat. Yet this doesn't explain how people on ketogenic low-carb diets can consume a diet that contains 70% fat and still lose weight very rapidly. And a lot of fat, by the way. I mean, they lose a lot of body fat. So while, while calories do count, they are hardly all the same. You know, so you can't go by that. So another one, this is one of my favorites. And I think I've mentioned this in previous videos also. Protein causes kidney disease. I'm asked that question all the time. This notion is based on old studies that involve patients with kidney failure. <laughs> That's a big difference. When the kidneys fail, they cannot handle large amounts of protein. For some reason, this information was applied to healthy people without existing kidney problems. The truth is that those with healthy kidneys can handle any amount of protein and it will not harm the kidneys. What does harm the kidneys is chronic high blood pressure and restricting water intake. Those are the things that are really, really hit your kidneys really hard. Another one is cooking with microwave causes loss of nutrients. In fact, research suggests that microwave cooking may be better for preserving nutrients than other cooking methods such as boiling or frying. One study that involved cooking vegetables concluded that, according to the method of analysis chosen, griddling, microwave cooking, and baking alternately produce the lowest losses, while pressure cooking and boiling lead to the greatest losses. Frying occupy, occupies an, an intermediate position. In short, water is not the cook's friend when it comes to preparing vegetables. According to a 1982 review, overall, the nutritional effects of microwaves on protein, lipid, and minerals appear minimal. There is no report on the effects of microwaves on carbohydrate fraction in foods. A large amount of data is available on the effects of microwaves on vitamins. It is concluded that there is only slight differences between microwave and conventional cooking on vitamin retention in foods. In conclusion, no significant nutritional differences exist between foods prepared by conventional and microwave methods. Any differences reported in the literature are minimal. So microwave is not as bad as people think, even though there's some radiation involved. Cholesterol doesn't matter. Many people think that having high blood cholesterol levels don't ma doesn't matter in relation to cardiovascular disease. This involves a confusion between consuming foods that contain cholesterol, such as egg yolks, and the level of cholesterol in the blood. One form of cholesterol carrying the blood, low-density lipoprotein, is definitely linked to cardiovascular disease when oxidized. But the cholesterol in food is hardly absorbed and isn't important. In other words, to put it simply, uh, you, you, you uh, normally absorb about maybe 2% of the cholesterol content in food. So unless you have a, uh, some sort of genetic problem where you absorb more cholesterol, or if you, let's say you already have a raging case of heart, heart disease, the cholesterol in food is irrelevant, but not the cholesterol in the blood. You have to separate the two. Another one that I did a video on this. I did an entire video on what I'm about on this one here, but I'll say it again because people still talk about it. Coffee contains mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are harmful compounds that come from mold. They're present in many popular foods. There's a myth uh, that, that coffee, uh, the nuts also tend to get, contain mycotoxins. There's a myth that most coffee contains dangerous amounts of uh, mycotoxins. You see a lot of these organic coffee sites, uh, they're selling uh, very, very high-priced coffee, and they, their biggest uh, selling point is that our organic coffee is free of mycotoxins. And they, and they, and they, uh, they make statements that all commercial coffee is loaded with these mycotoxins. It's going to get you very sick. This, however, is unlikely. There are strict regulations controlling mycotoxin levels in foods. If a crop exceeds the safety limit, the producer must discard it. According to a review published in the journal Food Additives and C C Contaminants, studies show that if you drink four cups of coffee a day, you, you would consume only 2% of the maximum safe mycotoxin intake. These levels are well within the safety margin, and they have no effect. Uh, another, another one here is... Uh, this is the acid alkaline thing about how you should only, you should avoid acid foods. And according to this idea, if you want to stay healthy, avoid foods high in acid, but consume alkaline foods. 
Some people follow an alkaline diet and they argue that foods have either an acidic or alkaline effect on the body. Acidic foods lower the pH value of the blood, making it more acidic. Cancer cells only grow in an acidic environment. The truth is your body regulates your blood's pH value. It's very sensitive to the acidity level of the blood. And then if it goes to, uh, if you get too much acid, your body reacts by producing more buffer substances so, such as sodium bicarbonate in the kidneys and others that keep the pH of the blood very tightly controlled. It only changes significantly if you have severe poisoning or health conditions such as chronic kidney disease or your kidneys are failing. That can affect the pH level of the blood. Your blood is slightly alkaline by default and cancer can grow in an alkaline environment contrary to what the uh, alkaline diet people say. People who support the diet recommend avoiding meat, dairy, and grains, which they deem acidic. Alkaline foods are said to be mostly plant-based foods, such as vegetables and fruit. Now, there is some truth to one thing, however. Uh, if you eat a lot of uh, acidic, uh, uh, let's say a lot of protein foods, because of the amino acid content, uh, amino acids are acids. So it's, it's not going to affect your blood acidity, but it can. Uh, it's been shown in older people that eating uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a large amount of acid foods, it tends to stimulate more, more protein, muscle protein breakdown than usual. And the, uh, the simple uh, solution is to just add some alkaline foods, like especially foods high in potassium, because potassium completely blocks the effect. So it's a simple solution. Now, the other one is all carbohydrates are bad for you. Now, I personally am not a big fan of carbohydrates. As I've said in previous videos, Carbohydrates are the only thing that produce body fat in me. I never get fat from eating fat or protein, but if I eat too much carbohydrates, the fat comes on really fast, always has. But you know, to say that all, all carbohydrates are bad for you is just not really true. Although there's no, there's no human nutritional requirement for carbohydrates, but again, to say they're bad is all bad is incorrect. Natural carbs, especially those containing fiber, are healthy and provide nutrients that are hard to obtain in any other way. The bad carbs are the processed carbs or carbs without fiber. On, on the other hand, a low-carb diet is excellent for losing excess body fat and helping to control and prevent type 2 diabetes. So, and again, again, to say that all carbohydrates are bad is not sensical. The natural, unprocessed carbs are quite good for you. you again, if, you, if you're insulin insensitive or have a sensitivity to carbohydrates, you don't want to go crazy and eat, you know, just load up on all kinds of natural carbs because again anything in excess with the exception of protein can you know produce body fat uh this one here is really pisses me off i gotta say it i've said this before several times i'll say it again the notion you get a lot of people saying this no food supplements are necessary they're all snake oil <laughs> i can't help laughing how stupid that is food supplements are just that nutrients to replace what's missing in your diet Another good use of supplements is to provide concentrated sources of nutrients without excessive added calories. A good example of this is or, or that are protein supplements, which is basically like 90% protein, very little fat, not much car calories at all, allows you to get a lot of protein without having to take in a lot of calories. That's the big advantage of protein supplements. However, it's also true that dietary supplements are largely unregulated. Unreg supposed to be regulated by the Food Drug Administration, but they don't. They only respond to report adverse uh, effect reports. Like, for example, <clears throat> if, uh, let's say, one of these pre-workout supplements, if you get a number of people who report getting sick on it or getting serious problems like strokes or heart attacks, that's when the FDA does something about the supplement. But under normal conditions, they don't monitor the quality or the potency of any supplement, so you're on your own. Uh, and, and the, you know, dietary supplements are unregulated, and unfortunately, many commercial supplements are underdosed or don't match the label claims that contain nutrients. This is a major problem, major problem. That's why you see a lot of supplements that has these things called uh, proprietary ingredients. You look on the label, it has, let's say, contains 1,100 milligrams of the following, and has about, tw about 20 other ingredients after that, but they don't list how much. So, you know, you, you have no idea how much of, uh, of these ingredients you're getting with supplement. It could have maybe a gram. It could have like nothing. So, you know, you're basically being ripped off. It's just a way of ripping off consumers. 
Now, if this is an ongoing problem, the best way to deal with it is to buy only from more, more reputable companies or join websites that analyze the contents of nutritional supplements such as ConsumerLab.com. I'm not advertising for Consumer Lab, but they are pretty honest in their analysis of commercial food supplements. They'll give you a good idea of, of what the supplements actually contain. I think it costs about 30 or 40 bucks a year to join. It's a pretty useful site for the, if you're interested in that. Another reason to use, uh, to use supplements is because some are not found in sufficient amounts in food. Examples of vitamin D. If you don't go out in the sun with most of your body exposed for 15 to 20 minutes every day, the sun has to be in the right uh, uh, part of the sky to emit the, uh, the correct uh, wavelength of ultraviolet rays. Usually in the winter in the, in the northern latitude, it is not in the right part of the sky. So even if you went out in the snow with your shirt off, you're still not going to get vitamin D production in the body. Uh, and vitamin D is very scarce in foods. So the only real way to get a good level of active vitamin D in the body is to take a vitamin D supplement. Usually it's about 2,000 units a day. There's no way around that. Vitamin E also. To get the uh, amount of vitamin E that's been shown to have beneficial health effects is almost impossible. You'd have to drink like like uh, five quarts of vegetable oil. Nobody's going to do that. Or you could take one little 400-unit uh, pill of vitamin E. Uh, I would go with the supplement. <laughs> Magnesium is another uh, Another vital nutrient, it's often lacking in diets that people don't eat uh, nuts and vegetables in good quantity. Uh, they're not going to get enough magnesium. Surveys show that 85% of Americans don't get even the minimal 400 milligram suggested dose of magnesium. So supplements can come in very handy there too. And if you do opt to take a magnesium supplement, go with magnesium glycinate or magnesium citrate. They're the best absorbed forms. Don't take more than 200 milligrams because it, any more than that acts as a laxative. Uh, you don't want to have to walk around wearing diapers as a certain president does. Uh, I'm not going to mention names. Uh, but anyway, that's about it. If you want uh, more information on nutrition, exercise science, ergogenic aids, anti-aging research you can use today, fat loss techniques that really work, hormonal therapy, women's health and fitness, food supplement science, which supplements work, which ones don't. Subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. When you subscribe, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page. Each day, I post new information on on, on, uh, on uh, uh, nutrition, exercise, general health, and medicine. But you have to be a subscriber to get an invitation to join my private Facebook page. Also, people can ask me questions on the Facebook page. I also have an email portal uh, on my Applied Metabolics webpage where current subscribers only can send me short questions. I'll be happy to answer as a benefit of their subscription. Uh, I don't I don't answer questions from uh, unsolicited uh, people. In other words, people who aren't subscribers. You're welcome to leave comments and suggestions for future videos under under this uh, this uh, video in the comment section. Uh, I uh, I will look at the suggestions. If I feel that the uh, the suggestions for videos will interest a, a larger number of people, I'll be happy to do a video on it. However, I will not. I don't have the time to answer questions that are left under the video. Others are welcome. Anyone who wants to answer any question that's uh, listed under one of my videos, feel free to answer. It's okay with me. I just don't have the time because I have to. Uh, my subscribers come first, and I, I only answer questions submitted by by current subscribers. That's my policy. So uh, I know people keep ignoring. I keep saying this in videos. And they keep asking me questions. They're just gonna, you know, it's just gonna be whistling in the wind because I don't have time to answer questions left under the videos. And I, from what I can see, most other people don't either. But that's just the way it is. I mean, we're already giving you free information. Come on. But, you know, what do you want us to hold your hand and feed you too? <laughs> All right, that was sarcastic. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, <laughs> that's about it. If you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter. Adopt a dog. They'll never be sarcastic. They'll always be kind and loving to you. They're the best animals in the world. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>